In July 2014, I left my dream job as a designer at IDEO San Francisco and as a lecturer at Stanford University. And with one backpack, I hop on a container ship that sailed across the Pacific. Three weeks later, when I arrived in China, I took the Trans-Siberian train from Beijing to Moscow and a few more trains across Europe. I then boarded another ship from London across the Atlantic to New York, and then a few more trains across America all the way back to San Francisco. And all this took just a little over 80 days. Let me first assure you that I don't have the fear of flying. But why did I travel all around the world without hopping on a single plane? It all started when I was born. But before I move on, I'd like to put on a little disclaimer that this talk has no happy ending. I don't have an audacious goal to save the world. I'm just a normal guy trying to figure out what to do with his life. What I do know is that I really, really love what I do. And I'm here to share that perspective with you. It all started when I was born, born into a family of two amazing individuals, my dad being an expert on Northern Thai arts and culture, and my mom being a PhD nanoscientist with that slogan on, on the side of her wall that says, yes, I can. So ever since I was young, I've always looked up to my parents. I've always wanted to be as accomplished as they are. And I've always been this hardworking student, the kind that listens to his parents, the kind that sits in front of the classroom, the kind that raises his hand when the teacher asks the question. And doing so earned me straight A's throughout school, year after year after year. Until one day, I faced a very difficult question. What do I study in college? Unlike problem sets, unlike standardized tests, there were no simple right or wrong answers. And most of my friends gravitate towards what their parents expect them, the safer, more traditional majors. And I knew that my mom wanted the same for me. It was around then that I discovered Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Flash. And I re remember really enjoying playing with it. It was around then that I heard this little voice inside of me, and it said, choose design. <laughs> design? I remember looking up how much a typical designer makes and thinking, how can I afford a nice lifestyle with that kind of salary? The voice kept saying, choose design. I remember asking my mom, and her response was, if that's what you want, then fine. And even though she approved of my choice, I knew that deep down inside, she was a little disappointed. So fast forward to design school and getting the first grade back for my first assignment. And it was a C. Imagine a straight A kid who, for the first time, decided not to listen to his parents, getting a C. My heart was broken, and I thought I picked the wrong major, and I thought about quitting. But me being a hardworking kid, I pushed through, I did all my all-nighters, and I started getting A's again, and this is what my work looked like. But more important than the grades, I remember really enjoying making things with my hands, making all the models, the prototypes, and I couldn't imagine doing anything else besides design. And remember how I thought designers didn't make much money? Well, right out of college, I was offered a job at Microsoft making way more money than I expected. And with all the great employee benefits, it was a no-brainer. I didn't even have to think about it. And I took the job. But most importantly, most importantly, I was making my parents proud. My mom would wear a t-shirt that says Microsoft on it. My dad 
would tell all his friends that Purin works for Microsoft, Purin works for Bill Gates, and it sounded so impressive. It took me about a year to realize that money and the Microsoft name wasn't everything. I, you know, on one hand, life was very comfortable, but work was not very fulfilling. I felt like a tooth in a gear in a big, slow-moving machine. And it was then when that little voice spoke to me again. And this time, it said. Quit your job. Quitting my job. What about money? What about stability? What about sounding impressive? And wouldn't it look bad on my resume if I leave this job after one year? The voice kept saying, "Quit your job." Well, I remember asking my parents, you know, "Hey, mom and dad, I'm going to leave my job," and their response was. Do not leave your job. <laughs> the economy is bad out there. No one leaves their job. For the next two years, I well, I bought a one-way plane ticket back to Thailand. Tried to start up a web startup and failed. And I traveled to India, to China, and around Southeast Asia with my dad. I built a house, designed and built a house here in Bangkok. To get a taste of what it's like to be an architect, I became a monk to gain perspective and clarity. I then worked for a small design firm here, right here in Bangkok, called Farm Group, and had an amazing time. And because of all that, I went on to study and then teach design at Stanford University. Because of all that, I was very fortunate to get to work with some of the most brilliant people. At IDEO San Francisco, as a principal product designer, and because of all that, in 2003, Pulse News, the product I helped design while at Stanford, was acquired by LinkedIn for 90 million dollars. So, in retrospect, you know, thinking back to it, quitting that Microsoft job was a real no-brainer. Had I not done it, I would not have had such great. And inspiring life experiences. So when it came time, when that voice spoke to me again, I knew. I knew that leaving my IDEO job, my Stanford job, traveling all around the world, not knowing what I'm going to do next, it's going to be all right in the end. And to answer that, but why question, why did I travel? It's because of this little voice inside of me. It's like. An itch that I need to scratch. And by the time I got back to San Francisco, and seeing all the inspirations I see throughout my trip, that inner voice was loud and clear in telling me to start making art with my hands again. And that's what I've been doing in the recent months. I recently had a solo gallery show with new interactive art pieces that I'm very proud of. And while Not having a nine-to-five job, and calling myself an artist, and having to explain all this to my friends and family is really, really scary. I've been having so much fun making art with my hands again. I cannot imagine having any other jobs. I cannot imagine doing anything else. So, I'm fairly sure that I'm not the only person in this room who's heard these voices. Whispering to us, and too many times we choose to ignore it. This is true for students choosing their majors in college, only to go with the ones that their parents tell them to, only to go with the ones that the scores allow them to. This is even true for employees trying to get out of unfulfilling careers, only to cling on to their safe, stable jobs. This is even true for big companies that I've worked with, trying to be innovative, trying to think outside the box, only to fall back to incremental product improvements. I think that playing it safe is in our nature as hunters and gatherers, because we don't want to walk into dark and scary forests. Otherwise, we'll get 
eaten alive by wild animals. The modern world, however, needs bold and creative risk takers. Because Christopher Columbus was not playing it safe when he sailed across the Atlantic to discover new worlds. The Wright brothers were definitely not playing it safe when they took the first human flight. And Elon Musk dared to start a payments company, a solar company, an electric car company, and even a space rocket company. So here's my little hypothesis. In order to make a dent in the universe and cause ripples to go out throughout the universe, we must fight off this urge to play it safe. We need to find creative ways to trick our heads to follow our hearts. And here are three examples, three ideas to get you started today. Number one is writing out things that you want to do before you die. Because when we face death, we tend to do what's most important to us. And this idea was inspired by a graphic designer named Stefan Sackmeister. And this is what his list looks like. This is what my list looks like. My list looks like bonus, no. My list looks like I want to, I want to travel around the world by land and sea, check. I want to have, make art and have a solo gallery show, check. I want to speak at TED and be on a TED stage, check. You know, this list can be as grand or as tiny as you want it to be, and there are no right or wrong answers. But you get bonus karma points if you're able to find this intersection between what makes you happy, whether that's money or fame or whatever, and what the world needs help with. Solving problems in health, environment, energy, whatever you can come up with. It's a minor difference between asking yourself what you can take, take, take from the world versus what you can take from the world and give back to the world at the same time. The second one is choosing must over should. And this one was inspired by El Luna. Um, she describes should as how others want us to show up in the world how we're supposed to think. But must is different. Must is who we are, what we believe in, what we do when we're our truest, what we do when we're alone with our truest and most authentic self. So if you ever confuse your inner voice versus other people's voices, try this should versus must test. Is it, I must study medicine, or I should study medicine? Is it, I must keep my job even though I hate it? Or, I should keep my job even though I hate it? I should make art with my hands again? Or, I must make art with my hands again? See the difference. And the third and last one is taking mini retirements to gain perspective. And again, this one was inspired by Stefan Sackmeister, who borrows from his retirement years and spread those years throughout his working years. So what he does during these off years is that he closes his New York design studio, and then he travels and retires in different countries. And by retirement, I'm not talking about a beach vacation on a resort and taking photos of yourself, posting on Instagram. I'm, not, I'm talking about the kind where you step outside your bubble and seeing the world for what it is. Gain perspective, seeing the world through different lenses. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to take that much time. And I'm more than sure that if you were to do this, you end up with a much richer life by the end, by the time you retire. So try some of these tricks on yourself and see if you can get in touch with your inner voice. And don't let other people's voices drown your own. Because the ultimate risk that you can take it's not to take any risk at all. Thank you.